Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being with us here. To get started with data in terms of our numbers for today, we have 49 new cases that have been reported. There are currently 126 people with COVID-19 in the hospital. Of these 126, 17 are in the intensive care unit and 13 of those 17 are on a ventilator in the ICU. Sadly, we have 11 new COVID-19 associated fatalities to report. Six of these people were in their 70s, two of them were in their 80s, and three were in their 90s. I just ask people to find a moment at some point today to pause and remember all the Rhode Islanders who we have lost throughout this pandemic. To transition, I want to thank the governor for her leadership when it comes to our focus on communities uh, that are more densely populated, on communities of color, and the variety of scenarios that she mentioned where we need to keep our focus strong. For the high density communities, I also want to acknowledge Mayor Grebian in Pawtucket and Mayor Diosa in Central Falls, along with their teams for their tremendous work. We recognize that those mayors and many across Rhode Island are facing some difficult circumstances and all things considered, they and their teams are doing an amazing job. The high density communities work that the governor outlined is starting in Pawtucket and Central Falls as a partnership with those communities. And we will expand into the other high density communities mentioned in the very near future, already making plans uh, towards that. I also wanna recognize Julian Drix from the Rhode Island Department of Health and the entire team across all of the work streams. Uh, who have been focused on this partnership from the state side, starting with Pawtucket and Central Falls, and we will continue to expand from there as mentioned. As we've been saying for years, our work to address health disparities has been going on well before COVID-19 and the pandemic started. We have been able to take advantage of that fact and help um, take steps forward quicker as a state because of our existing health equity zones collaborative um, infrastructures. We uh, have health equity zones in all of the cities that we've mentioned that are considered most densely populated. Starting with Pawtucket and Central Falls that has one unified health equity zones. To just explain a little bit further what it's about, Health equity zones are made up of residents, community groups, healthcare providers, housing advocates, people in education, uh, people in municipal leadership, and many others. While health is a part of the model, we are clear about saying it's not just the health care piece. It needs to look at all of the factors that contribute to someone being healthy, living in a community, what their housing is, what their education is, um, what access to fresh fruits and vegetables they have. The health equity zone model is about bringing these leaders from the community together and supporting their work to address the issues that they have identified as impacting their ability to live in a healthy community. When it comes to COVID-19, the vision is for the community infrastructure of the health equity zones to be a central um, focus that can expand and make sure to get resources to community organizations so that they can better serve the residents in those communities. It's a ready-made infrastructure already set to disperse those resources out to residents. Our health equity zones are also going to continue to be a major conduit of information for us so that we can continue a bi-directional flow of information, making sure that the community's voice is at the forefront. 
whether it's support with housing or improving food access or addressing utilities, our health equity zones will be able to make us aware in real time about what people's needs are at the community level. In addition to having the health equity zones partner with us on resources and information sharing, we also envision the health equity zones getting involved in our testing and contact tracing work as they've already begun. For example, health equity zones will be able to continue to support our case investigators and contact tracers in connecting with people who we have needed to reach. And our health equity zones are going to help us identify and overcome barriers when it comes to testing and contact tracing. They've already been instrumental in helping us get personal protective equipment and masks out to communities and families. Um, what we want to continue to advance is having health equity zones um, continue to help us shape our ability to respond at the community level. Um, they've told us where testing should happen. Something as simple as picking one site over the other for testing can make all the difference in terms of the numbers, even if they're only a few blocks apart. It's having that intel at the community level on the front lines. All this work is an exercise in balance. We're constantly balancing the need to take steps now to address the immediate impacts of COVID-19 while also addressing the structural issues that make people more vulnerable to COVID-19 in the first place. The example that's most helpful to share is housing. We know that people who have unstable housing and people who are experiencing homelessness are more vulnerable to COVID-19. For that reason, we've set up housing options for people who cannot quarantine or isolate right now in a way that's safe for them and their family. And as the governor announced last week through our Housing Now campaign, we're aiming to get people who are experiencing homelessness into at least 100 rental units. As we continue to act on these short-term immediate measures, we're also working with organizations like Rhode Island Housing and the Rhode Island Coalition for the Homeless on the larger issue of homelessness and the availability of housing and making housing secure. There has been an area, this has been an area where we have benefited enormously from the governor's leadership. This year, she's made work to expand the availability of safe and healthy housing for all Rhode Islanders a priority. This remains a focus for us and is even more critical through this COVID-19 response. This approach of addressing immediate needs while also focusing on larger structural solutions is present throughout all of our work, including what we're doing on employment and access to care and education. So before passing things back to the governor, I can make one last uh, comment on that. We've been talking a lot in the last week about schools and plans for reopening. There's an intersection here with the needs and challenges in our communities that are more densely populated. While we are making things uniform and making it so that every child is able to return to in-person school on the same calendar, as the governor mentioned, we also know that communities are different and schools are different with different needs. And we're going to be working extremely hard along with our uh, leaders and partners in uh, education and very closely with our high density communities to make sure that students, families, teachers, and schools have the support they need to all move together in reopening. We know that all kids deserve an equal opportunity to be in school, to be learning, and to be thriving. And we're going to be very attentive and responsive to the needs of each community so we can ensure that this is happening in every zip code in Rhode Island.